Well, uh, people are coming in. I'll, I'll take the opportunity to start and say welcome to you all. My name is Anja Limbeck. I'm with Local Future and I'm here with my colleague, uh, Carly Gale. And uh, we're really happy to welcome uh, three heavyweights with around uh, local economy building and post-carbon world. And I'm uh, also like to say welcome to the participants that are about to come in now. Thank you for joining us. And I also want to say welcome to all the ones that are watching this afterwards as a recording. And uh, before I get into the introduction, I'll just hand over to Carly, who's going to uh, say a few things about housekeeping here. Thanks, Anya. Um, so just a few quick things. So for questions for our panelists, um, you can go ahead and put those in the Q&A window, which you can access by clicking on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. And if you can go ahead and at the start of your question, add your name and your location, that would be great. And for comments that go to everybody, uh, we'll go ahead and use the chat box. And at the bottom of that, if you can click the blue button that says panelists, change that to panelists and attendees so that everyone can see your comments. That would be great. Um, so that's all for me. Back to you, Anya. Thank you. So I want to introduce uh, three great people here. And uh, for me, it's like a, a, a unique experience and a, a real treat to have you all three together, which I, I, I think it will be a treat for everybody. So uh, Judy, uh, Judy Wicks, is a world-renowned uh, local living uh, economist, or not an economist, but a local living movement builder. And uh, she's the co-founder of, of Bali, uh, the, uh, the building, no, the, sorry, the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies. And of course, those that know uh, uh, Judy from before also know that she founded uh, a kind of, Trend setting cafe, the White Dog Cafe, uh, which it was a or it was a farm to fork business that a lot of others have been following in your footsteps afterwards. And Michael, you are also uh, uh, Michael Schumann, uh, a leading local economist. Uh, you are also the I think a founding member of Ballet, and also a um, fellow of the Post Carbon Institute. And Richard Heinberg, not least, I think you are probably a well-known voice all over the world, at least in Mexico, I know, and in Denmark, advocating for a shift away from fossil fuel-based economies. And also a senior fellow of the Post Carbon Institute. And I just, just before we, I came on, I pulled out some of the things in my library, which happens to be, to be your books that have been my fellow companions for many years. So this is a real pleasure. And of course, we are here to talk about um, a global to local shift and about how to get there. And uh, so who better than you guys to, to uh, contribute to this and show us the way. So what we'll do now is that uh, um, Richard will start followed by Michael and Judy, and they will each, uh, share from their vast experience for about 10 minutes each. Then we're gonna shift in to a conversation between the four of us. And for the last half an hour of this uh, webinar, it will be open for questions. So please uh, just line up your questions because you're gonna hear a lot of interesting things and just put it in the Q&A box. So Richard, I'm gonna hand over the word to you so you can kickstart this event. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Anya. Um, I'm going to talk for just a few minutes about uh, placemaking, which I think is, is relevant to the whole subject of, of localization. Um, August 29th, 2005, I was sitting, of all places, in a hotel room in Guatemala City. And uh, on the TV in front of me was uh, satellite image of Hurricane Katrina moving toward New Orleans. 
this was significant for me because New Orleans is kind of uh, a second home. My wife, Janet, is from New Orleans. And uh, if you have any familiarity with, with that city, you know that people tend to stay, people who are born there tend to stay there. And, and she, so she's always maintained a close relationship with the city. And we, we go there at least once a year. Um, love the place. Uh, was it Tennessee Williams who wrote, there's New York, there's San Francisco, and there's New Orleans. Every place else is just Cleveland. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a city that really has uh, a, a, a sense of itself as a, a cultural center with music, food, art, <clears throat> architecture, everything that's uh, uh, unique and, and lovable. So to see New Orleans uh, in the direct crosshairs of this um, category five, actually when it landed, it was category three hurricane was, uh, was deeply upsetting. And of course I, I followed the recovery process. Janet went back to New Orleans as soon as she could and, and helped with uh, um, housing inspection. Um, and, uh, and as we traveled back, we, we talked not only to you know, friends and relatives, but artists and musicians and all sorts of people about the, the process of recovery. And the, the art and music scene was absolutely essential to that recovery process because what New Orleans lost was not just a bunch of houses, it was, it was people and this sense of, of, of place. Um, well, October 8th, 2017, uh, this time I'm, I'm at home uh, and at 3 a.m., a knock on our, our front door. I get up, I open the front door and the entire Northern horizon is in flames. Um, and uh, the, the, the wind is blowing in our direction at a gale force. So of course we, we pack up and leave. This was the, the Tubbs fire that, uh, that decimated our, our hometown of, of Santa Rosa, California. And uh, later we were able to tour the, the areas that had been hardest hit. Um, the Coffee Park area looked, to, to say that it looked like a, a, a war zone is, is putting it too mildly. It looked like ground zero, ground zero for a nuclear explosion, just nothing, total devastation. Um, and recovery again uh, was something that we, we followed very carefully and, and did our best to participate in. At the one year anniversary, I was invited to uh, play in a string quartet to, you know, at a, a party that, that was held there in Coffee Park. Uh, a few homes were, were already, you know, recognizably being rebuilt, but the people of Coffee Park were coming together to, you know, affirm their intention to be a, a, a community and to, and to rebuild and to make the place um, more meaningful for, for themselves and for the city than, than ever before, which they, which they have done. Um, I bring this up because my, uh, my, my day job as a senior fellow at Post Carbon Institute keeps me in, painfully informed of things like climate change, resource depletion, the disappearance of wild nature, global water and air pollution, and so on. And I happen to know, intellectually at least, that these two places near and dear to me New Orleans and Santa Rosa uh, may very well be uninhabitable in decades, if, if not years. Um, that's kind of the direction things, things are going. So what does this mean for localization, for placemaking? Uh, it's something I've given uh, a fair amount of thought to. And it, it seems to me that the important thing in in building local futures may not necessarily be particular places so much as the place-making instinct that we all have within us. Um, and it's that instinct that creates ties of, of culture and of love between us and 
the particular environments we inhabit. And that takes the form of all the things that I've, I've men mentioned, art and architecture and music and dance and, and food and, and, and so on. Uh, and it's a tragedy when particular places are lost, but we're gonna be, be seeing that tragedy unfolding in, in increasing measure as time goes on. Um, so it's really vital that that placemaking instinct be nurtured in ourselves and the people we know. And the way we nurture it is to exercise it, even knowing that these places um, may, be, may be gone in the future. Uh, it's important that when we invest as much meaning in them as we can now to keep that instinct alive and to exercise it and, and to transfer it to whatever places um, we, happen to, we happen to inhabit. So there, those are just some thoughts um, that maybe can kick off our discussion and um, there's, there's a lot of places to go from there. So. Thank you, Richard. I, I'm taking notes here because uh, I hadn't actually thought about the need to nurture placemaking as an instinct. And I, I think you were quite right. And uh, so let's return to this um, in it or in a few minutes. I think this is a very important point. Michael. I'll hand over the word to you. Great. Uh, thanks. And hopefully um, you can see my screen. So I want to focus on my favorite topic of late, which is where we put our money and start with a very simple proposition. If you put your money in the things you distrust or are destroying the world, you're gonna have a very pessimistic outlook on the fate of the earth. If you put money into what you love and is around you, your community will thrive. And that's the central argument for thinking about local investing seriously. And I do wanna call out uh, that I've done two books on this subject, if you're interested in going in deeper, the one on the left is courtesy of Richard and his institute. Uh, they helped to really put seed capital into making this happen almost 10 years ago. And then the one on the right is more recent and talks about how to put your pension funds into local business. Some fun facts about local business that most of you know, but this is for the United States. Um, about 60 to 80% of our economy is in locally owned business, depending upon how you define local business. These businesses are key for local prosperity. They are key for equality. We've got some good evidence on that and they're highly competitive. These businesses are also highly profitable. These are some interesting data from Canada uh, in 2009, looking at profit rates across different sizes of business. The most profitable businesses are those with 10 to 20 employees. The least profitable businesses are those traded on the Toronto Stock Exchange, go figure. One of the things that I do when I speak with audiences in person, which regret, regretfully we can't do today, is I ask those of you with any life savings at all, how many of you have at least 1% of those savings in locally owned business. And there are very, very few hands that come up, which means that all of us are over-investing in Fortune 500 companies we distrust and under-investing, frankly, most of us not investing at all in the local businesses we love. And in the U.S. context, if we were to change this kind of mismatch, if we were to put, you know, the amount of money that belongs in the local economy in there, it would translate to about $100,000 per person of additional capital available for local businesses. It's hard to imagine an economic development strategy that would be more powerful than changing our investment habits. 
but you know, you don't need perfection in order to achieve this. This is a study that I did in um, Metro Ohio, uh, Metro Cleveland uh, in 2010, looking at the impacts of a 25% shift to local food. And what we found is that a 25% shift in people's purchasing patterns toward local food would create 27,000 new jobs, pay almost a billion dollars in new wages and generate $126 million in new taxes. Now to achieve this, you would need to expand the local business capital stock, um, newer expanded local businesses. We had calculated that would be about three quarters of a billion dollars. But that's the tiny red stripe on the left, because three quarters of a billion dollars turns out to be 1% of what Metro Clevelanders have in their bank accounts, and a quarter of 1% of what they have in their pension funds. So the point is, is that even a very small shift that we make from global to local investing can make a huge difference in community well-being. And there's a lot of things that we all can do to make this local investment revolution happen. I think that it's helpful to sort of think about yourself, you know, and again, this is in the United States context, but, you know, people in our country sort of generally fall into one of three categories. If you're in the bottom third, of income or wealth, your biggest challenge is getting out of debt. But there's a lot of things that you can do, actually, to number one, localize that debt, get out of credit card debt, and maybe relocalize that with friends or family, to do your banking at a local bank or credit union, to do more of your purchasing at co-ops, which are very supportive of farmers in the local economy. If you're in the middle third, of income or wealth, chances are good that when you sail into retirement, most of your wealth is gonna be in your house. So getting that decision right is really important. And moving from being a renter to a local owner of a house turns out to be one of the most important financial decisions you can make, but also putting efficiency and solar into your house, building a greenhouse, these are things that actually, when you work out the economics of it, pay better than Wall Street. And if you're in the top third of income or wealth, this is where you might have some pension savings and to start thinking about how you can move those pension savings from Wall Street to Main Street, how you might be able to invest in new businesses in your community, even in nonprofits that you're part of to help the nonprofit, say, buy its property so that the nonprofit operates at a lower rate every year. Um, and there's a lot that we can do to sort of move this forward. Now, I think that, that the laundry list, uh, the to-do list that we want to follow is both individual and community. As individuals, I encourage all of you to identify yourselves as local investment champions. I'm about to start a new journal, a newsletter called the Main Street Journal as an alternative to the Wall Street Journal. And I'm going to invite people to name themselves as local investment champions so that people living around you can form groups and start working together. And if you start working together, here are some success stories of what could happen. This story comes from Port Townsend, Washington, just north of Seattle, uh, where in 2007, they created something called Lion, the Local Investment Opportunity Network. It basically is a po monthly potluck dinner. People come together, both local businesses, local investors, and they build relationships. And this simple act of relationship building has led to a million dollars per year in new local investing in a town of 10,000 people. Another thing you can do is change the law because one reason people invest in big corporations is that the law favors them. In the United States, we made some changes in the law to favor 
investment crowdfunding. I took this picture from the Rose Garden when President Barack Obama signed in the Jobs Act. And since then, uh, since crowdfunding was effectively legalized, investment crowdfunding, not donation crowdfunding, since it was legalized in 2016, more than a million Americans have put a billion dollars into grassroots small businesses. The average investment is $800. The average business is raising nearly $300,000. And the most successful entrepreneurs have been women and people of color, those that the marketplace have traditionally overlooked. A third example, in Baltimore, a friend and I put up a very simple website called the Maryland Neighborhood Exchange in order to help Baltimore residents identify which businesses are being crowdfunded. So if you want to invest in a Baltimore company, go to this, go to our site and we'll quickly make that available to you. We reckon that we've helped to steer over the past year, $3 million to 36 businesses, most of them run by BIPOC entrepreneurs. And the last example that I want to give is education. We think, at least in the United States context, there are tools that people can use to localize their pension funds. They're called self-directed IRAs and solo 401ks. And a group of us put up uh, a website called The Next Egg that brings in uh, several hundred people who are trying to do this to support and educate one another around this. So my bottom line about all of this is that local investment is important. It can reshape our communities and there are very simple ways you can get it done. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you, Michael. You surprise me every time because you come up with something new I hadn't heard before, even though I'm following you closely. So this is exciting. Was about the lion and what's happening in Maryland. So uh, we'll return to this. And uh, uh, Judy, we're going to hand over to you, Judy, to tell us what's happening in Pennsylvania. OK, thank you, Ancha. It's great to be here with Local Futures and with my friends and colleagues, uh, Michael and Richard. Uh, so um, my journey with local economies began with the founding of the White Dog Cafe in 1983. Uh, we were a pioneer farm to table movement. And um, over the next 20 years, uh, we, we grew a network of farmers that supplied the white dog. Uh, at around two, 2000, um, I was thinking to myself about how this had become our market niche, our competitive advantage. Uh, but I suddenly realized and had a transformational moment uh, that uh, it wasn't enough just to have a network of feeding my own restaurant, uh, that I had to turn my attention um, to uh, the region, to a larger network, uh, a system of supply chains that would um, feed the whole region. Um, and uh, uh, since that time, uh, that has become my focus of uh, creating these uh, supply chains. Uh, so um, another factor for me was in the 90s, I, I spent a number of years going down to um, Chiapas to uh, support the, the Zapatistas, and it was from them that I re realized and under, began to understand the importance of local self-reliance, something I hadn't uh, thought about so much. Uh, and they had their uprising to demand um, that they maintain their, their local self-reliance and not be forced into the global economy. Uh, so, and that made me see about how communities around the world were, lo were losing their self-reliance self and that we were all becoming dependent on these long distance supply chains uh, to deliver our basic needs, uh, supply chains owned by multinational corporations. So um, this was a this was a motivator for me uh, to uh, to change that. Uh, and most recently, now with climate change, uh, we realize that we we cannot depend on these vulnerable long distance global supply chains to deliver us what we need to survive. Um, that these supply chains will be increasingly uh, vulnerable. Uh, not only from weather, uh, but pandemics, from cyber attacks, uh, ter terrorism, what have you, uh, that the need to, to localize uh, was never more clear uh, and more urgent. Um, so um, two years ago, I started what I call um, All Together Now Pennsylvania. Uh, that's my state of, of, Pens of uh, Pennsylvania. And our focus um, is on supply chains. Uh, 
I was um, uh, motivated first uh, two years ago when hemp was legalized. Um, uh, the, the United States uh, made a very foolish mistake uh, 80 years ago uh, in making hemp illegal. Um, and so that held us back. Um, and suddenly it became legal again. Um, and as I got to know this versatile plant, I saw the possibilities of hemp uh, providing for almost all our basic needs. Um, it's a food with hemp flour and hemp cooking oil and, um, and so on. And also um, as a plant medicine with, with CBD and, and THC and other cannabinoids that aren't even discovered yet. Uh, building materials uh, with hempcrete, um, which is a, uh, a building material that takes the place of uh, toxic fiberglass, that pink fiberglass uh, stuff that used for insulation and styrofoam and so on. Um, and um, as well as um, a, a clothing and textiles. Um, and then other things as well, paper, um, and it could even be a biofuel. So you really, you could, <laughs> you can survive on hemp alone, really, <laughs> providing all the basic needs. But yet in our state, there was a green gold uh, rush. All of the large corporations were coming into our state to uh, take advantage, you know, of this new opportunity. And so I thought now is the time to, to strike, you know, that we can't allow this new industry to be taken over by outside corporations. So um, I organized what I called uh, the Hemp Local Supply Chain Coalition um, two years ago and invited uh, farmers and entrepreneurs and researchers and advocates to join um, our group. And we started educating ourselves, you know, going around to the farms, went to Rodell Institute that was doing trials in hemp. Uh, went to Thomas Jefferson University uh, where they were doing experimentation and the uses uh, the end uses uh, of hemp. Uh, so um, then, I, you know, I eventually I realized that um, that in order for farmers to grow hemp, they had to know who was going to buy the hemp. Uh, and so we needed to um, develop the businesses that would be the end uses of hemp. You know, mind you, this was a, a, such a new industry. There's no infrastructure, there no products, nothing. It was all illegal. Uh, any hemp that the United States had was imported from Canada or even from Europe. Um, so, um, so then I, I developed the, the, supply, the supply chain coalitions um, around the end use. So uh, we have a, a food um, coalition, local food coalition, um, clothing and textile coalition, plant medicine coalition, and sustainable building materials. Um, and so uh, although our focus is on hemp, uh, we also um, are looking at the whole uh, um, vision uh, for a self-reliant, resilient, um, just, um, and uh, regenerative um, local economy uh, or economies, you know, th through our state. Um, so um, we began having events and, and various um, activities. Um, we were very stymied by, uh, by COVID, as everyone was. Uh, we had just started to have these gatherings uh, in different places in our state uh, around the hemp. Um, and then all of a sudden we had to stop you know, all that uh, just when we were about to have a big conference and so on. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, we persisted. Um, and you know, in the food area, we have a grain coalition that includes uh, grains other than hemp, um, uh, various uh, heritage grains. And there we're trying to connect um, the, the grain farmers were the end users, uh, the pasta makers, the bread makers, the noodle makers, the empanada makers, uh, the brewers, um, the distillers. Um, and we um, uh, partnered in, a, uh, in an event uh, called the Grain Train, um, which was a public event where people could appreciate all the different products made from local grains. Um, and so uh, with, with clothing and textiles, um, we've organized uh, local clothing designers um, and uh, manufacturers uh, to uh, promote um, uh, the idea that people buy clothing that's locally made, uh, though it might be more expensive to buy less. Um, and a lot of this um, uh, is really about a change of values. We call it you know, having a revolution of values, as uh, Dr. King used to say. Uh, uh, moving from a society that that uh, that values um, money and material goods uh, to one that uh, values uh, life. Um, uh, so um, 
uh, I just wanted to say that to me, that's sort of the foundation of all this work uh, is a is a change in consciousness. You know, to recognize, um, you know, that we're interconnected with other people and with nature and so on, um, and that when we make economic decisions, whether we're a consumer or um, a business owner or an investor, that uh, rather than making decisions that maximize our profit and material goods, that we make decisions in the in the in the best interest of the well-being of our communities and the well-being of our ecosystems. And that's the shift that is really necessary if we're going to save civilization. Period, uh, but certainly necessary for making the economic decisions that are needed to um, to localize our economy. Um, so. Um, with the clothing and textile, uh, we have a uh, we're supporting a project um, of um, a, a clothing or a textile um, maker. She makes uh, kitchen textiles out of linen that she imports from Europe right now, and she's working with a flax farmer uh, to grow the flax. Um, and they're working with fiber shed that's ahead of us on this process from the west coast uh, to actually um, make uh, textiles out of that flax. Uh, so they say they're about ready to introduce the first $1,000 napkin, <laughs> uh, but you got to start somewhere. Um, and so um, then with the building materials, we had a, um, a hempcrete week uh, to teach um, um, architects and builders, construction people and so on, and farmers, um, you know, how to grow, process and, um, and make hempcrete, um, how to apply it uh, in, in uh, creating the wall surface and, 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 and uh, insulation for buildings. Uh, hempcrete is um, a fire retardant, is, it's a, a mold resistant, a water resistant, pest resistant, um, you know, and it, it, it just, it, and it continually absorbs carbons, you know, forever. Uh, so, and when you're in a room that with hempcrete walls, it, it just feels good, you know, uh, as a continuous a surface, a continuous surface, so that um, as a, it's a, they say that the heating and, and, and cooling costs go down uh, from 30 to 60 percent um, from traditional insulation. So um, with um, uh, the Plant Medicine Coalition, uh, we're, we're, we're dealing with traditional plant medicines as well as um, CBD and THC. Um, and we had, um, we started promotional um, or, uh, uh, podcasts, um, educational uh, podcasts that uh, teach people about the benefits of plant medicine um, and where they can be um, where, where they can be located in our own communities. Um, so that's that's the work we're doing. Um, and I, 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 we're really, we say that what our mission is to uh, connect rural and urban communities uh, to build uh, resilient, just, and regenerative regional economies. Uh, and this urban rural divide um, that is really endangering our democracy um, is, 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 is something we feel uh, um, the healing of this divide is, is kind of a byproduct <laughs> of our work. Uh, and I, I was thinking about how it wasn't so long ago when rural and urban communities were connected because they co-created uh, local supply chains uh, and were inter, inter, interdependent uh, on those supply chains. And, and there was a, a trust uh, and a respect and an understanding between rural and urban communities. And that was all shattered uh, by globalization that su uh, severed these local supply chains and cast both uh, communities aside. Um, so we, um, I feel that the, the meeting place of, um, of the left and the right in the United States uh, lies in local self-reliance. Um, and, and that's something that we hope will, will come of our work um, as well as, um, you know, of, uh, uh, a bit becoming more prosperous um, and uh, and more joyful. Um, and as we, uh, Richard mentioned, uh, it's it's really about place making and relationships and 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 happiness. Um, so um, I'm I'm really uh, uh, digging uh, you know this work uh, in my own community. I spent a lot of time traveling and talking about local economies and other people's communities, and and now I'm I'm, I'm back to uh, doing it at home. Uh, so thanks everybody. Well, I think uh, I personally am very grateful you are back home doing just what you're doing, Judy, because uh, uh, there's uh, what you just shared about now is such a good example, not just for Pennsylvania or not just for the US, but the, the idea of linking, uh, again, relinking urban and rural areas into 
co-creating regional economies and also looking at industry is something that is overdue, I think. So uh, um, thank you for that. And thank you to all three of you. So, uh, so the idea is now we will shift into a bit of a conversation uh, with, between the panelists here. And then uh, the last half an hour will be for questions. So please line up your questions uh, uh, and so that we can get to them shortly. So sort of just pulling together the threads from what you all three were saying, I'm sort of thinking about this map from global to local. I think Richard, you started by saying, we need to nurture the place basing, uh, placemaking instinct. And particularly, I think that's true because so many of us are now ruthless in this global economy. No? So wherever we are, we need to kickstart this nurturing instinct of placemaking so that we can become the kind of activists that really uh, make changes from a global to local shift, just like uh, uh, we've heard from, from Michael and Judy now. So, and, uh, and then we heard about these uh, different opportunities, ways, really concrete ways that we can shift money away from high street to main street through local investment. And so I want to follow up on that and hear at the end about how all this comes together in, in this uh, regional efforts that Judy was describing. So I was sort of thinking now that um, in kind of synthesizing this, what do the three of you think are the, you know, kind of the key things that we need to do not just in the US, but in other places from a global to local shift. And here I want to think about uh, also how do we deal with uh, the corporates that we kind of need to control as well, right? We, Michael, you were, for example, talking now about the local investment, but then we've got, you know, Black Rock that is a, a investment management that has $9 trillion and uh, and for example own the mexican pension funds no uh, can are the efforts that we are trying to push from the bottom are they enough to deal with the situation that we have and how can that kind of effort that we're generating from the bottom also help us to influence uh, the things at the top that are basically shaping our economies and undermining our economies. Yeah? And so uh, one more thing there to add sort of also is like, I'd like to hear also from, from all of you, if you have any specific um, policy strategies that you think kind of can help us, that you are aware of, for example, Judy, I was seeing that on the uh, on your website, you are talking about advocating for policy shifts. No? So um, that's a little bit of everything to get, get the conversation going. I don't know, any one of you want to start a chip in with your thoughts and... Well, I'll, I'll, um, I'll say something. Um, you know, uh, uh, building on Richard's talking about placemaking uh, instinct, um, you know, I, I think of this about the, the instinct of, of, of coming home, um, that, um, you know, we've been such a mobile society um, and all this traveling is just, you know, burning all these carbons and whatnot. Um, and I, I, I know a couple of people lately who, who have come home, um, you know, that a young man, for instance, who was working in Iraq, he was working in Chicago, whatever, and now he's come to home to the place that he grew up uh, and, and, and bought a farm. Um, and, um, you know, uh, sometimes I want to write an article saying boomers come home because uh, the baby boomers, you know, as we retire, it's been tradition, you know, uh, in our society that a sign of success in your career when you retire, you travel. Um, and I don't feel like we should be doing that right now. Uh, I'm trying not to travel at all. Unfortunately, I have a grandson in California, so I could go there, but I, I don't do any recreational travel any longer. And I feel like we need to come home uh, and get to work. Um, and that the older generation, uh, this has to be an intergenerational movement. We can't just say, oh, well, the young, this, the young people will solve this. No, it, it'll take everybody to do that. Um, and, you know, um, 
I I um I I, I like um uh, a Gary a Gary Snyder's poem um you know that the first step is pick a place in the world and take responsibility for it, and if everybody did that, if everybody picked a place in the world and took responsibility for it and know that place, where does the food come from? Where does the water come from? Where does the energy come from? Where does the waste go? You know, and get involved. You know that to me is the first step, um, and it's it's not a it's not about a, a being a martyr. Uh, because quite frankly, that's where the joy is, uh, that, you know, uh, placemaking and community building. Uh, I lived in an Eskimo village one time, and it was there that I realized that uh, happiness had nothing to do with money. Uh, happiness has to do with community. Uh, and, and so often we're so busy traveling around that we don't have the community that really makes us happy. So we're traveling to try and find happiness. And it's really, it's, a, it's trite to say, but it's at home. <laughs> Uh, continuing on, on, on this theme of um, um, placemaking, I'd like to say a little bit about um, the arts. Um, I, I mentioned earlier that the arts were really important in, in the process of placemaking, but uh, I want to say a little bit more about that. Um, during the pandemic, some of the people who have uh, suffered the most are performing artists. Uh, venues shut down, revenue streams evaporating. Uh, I, I personally know a number of uh, performing artists who have just given up that career and found other other lines of work just because there's there's no way to there was no way to support themselves. Um, thriving communities generate culture, and uh, and that's really important. It's much more important than we give it credit for in the in the very literal sense of you know credit being. Uh, financial. Uh, and, and you can tell when you're in a, a real place like uh, New Orleans or Austin, Texas or Nashville that has a lot of uh, a local arts scene that's really thriving. The whole place just seems alive and people have, have a pride in being there. So what does it take to make that happen? Well, one of the things it takes is, uh, is venues. People putting themselves out to create uh, venues for local artists and, and musicians, um, restaurants and, and hotels and taverns and so on, making their, their places places of um, you know, communal celebration on a, on a regular basis where, where uh, amateur and semi-professional and professional artists can uh, can create and share. And in that sharing, of course, they, they get something, but the whole community uh, benefits enormously. The arts, we in, in modern capitalist societies, the arts are, are treated as a, a, a little doodad that's added on that, you know, maybe makes life a little more pleasurable and we're willing to, you know, devote a, a little money toward it. But what gets remembered, you know, who do, do we remember uh, Leonardo da Vinci or do we remember the, the guy who hired him to paint whatever picture, you know, well, the guy who hired him, is, his name is, is most, in most cases forgotten. Um, so it, uh, this is a plea, not just for more arts funding, but, but for a, a consciousness of the importance of the arts in our in our lives and in our communities, and for you know some creativity creativity in finding ways to enable our local creative artists to to thrive. I I agree with that, um, and I think there's lots of wonderful stories of communities that have nurtured their economies by finding what is their cultural or historic DNA. And, and you know, starting with that is, I mean, yes, there are, there, you know, Santa Fe is one of a kind, New Orleans is one of a kind, wine country and Northern California is one of a kind, but where you live is one of a kind. And the question is, what is in your unique DNA how can you find it? How can you express it? How can you bring places to life, whether through venues or even through certain kinds of businesses uh, to bring that DNA alive? 
there's one story that I love. I'm forgetting the name of this town in rural Georgia uh, that actually uh, reinvented itself. It's a couple of thousand people. And they decided that the way to reinvent themselves was to create historical theater. Um, and so they started to encourage people in the town to tell their stories and they produced an annual production around people coming, telling their stories. And suddenly there were tens of thousands of people coming to this town to hear about their stories because it was so well done and put themselves on the map. And, and really, you know, every place I think has that potential uh, if, if you look for it. So uh, I think it's also really undervalued, uh, may, maybe not undervalued, but we, we haven't as a movement of, for a systemic shift, perhaps explored enough the use of of arts and, and as a voice, no? As a voice for change. And uh, but, uh, just a little anecdote here, that uh, we've had uh, local uh, young people here uh, about the consumer culture to, you know, and they've been traveling all around in, in local communities here where I'm, I'm in Mexico. And uh, with a, a lot of effect, it was such a fun way of getting things across. And it was also a way to, you know, you can easily find that with celebration, which I know is something, Judy, you've been doing a lot of when, you, you know, you were doing a lot of awareness raising and using theater at, back with your uh, White Dog Cafe. Um, but um, what about like Michael now that, uh, about the local investment, you ha had a really good experience Example, which I thought was combining celebration with getting people to to invest locally by hosting these potlucks. That's what you were sharing about earlier, no? The lion, and um, so I, I, that seems to me to be an excellent model. And I also know that that uh, Judy, you are, have, are talking about you are sort of also working, kind of partnering, helping, you know, linking up organizations and businesses and. And, and local investors. So I think it'd be good if you could say a little bit more about that, how, how that works. And also uh, maybe a little bit about what we, do we do with the black rocks? You know, can, can we, you know, can we make sufficient change from the bottom up? Or, or do we all at this time need to make uh, pressure to regulate, it? you know, this is what Local Futures always hammers on about, that we at the same time, we do need to regulate finance because otherwise they keep on undermining the good efforts of, of around the world. Well, I'd, I'd like to share with everybody um, a, a project I have in Philadelphia that's associated with All Together Now, but a, sort of a separate nonprofit, and that's called the Circle of Aunts and Uncles. Um, and we're a, a microloan fund, and it's very simple. I, I just all started calling up uh, friends. What I saw is the potential of the baby boomers who have experience, knowledge, connections, money, and time, uh, and matching that with the potential of young entrepreneurs that are under-resourced, um, uh, so that, that together we can co-create uh, the, the local economy that we want to live in. Uh, and I've been doing that work for six years. Um, and actually next Monday, we are having our annual family reunion uh, where all the aunts and uncles and the nieces and the nephews and the distant cousins and so on all congregate. We're gonna have about uh, 50 people for dinner. Uh, so it's very much about celebration. Um, um, and um, it's, it's just amazing. Uh, so it's not only the money that we provide but also mentoring and connections and business. Um, and during the, the pandemic, uh, some of our businesses were really suffering. And so we converted $25,000 from our loan fund into uh, direct grants uh, for our existing entrepreneurs rather than making new loans. Um, and people were really engaged in this. Uh, you know, one aunt, you know, bought $500 worth of gift certificates at a coffee shop of a, a young uh, black entrepreneur that was um, struggling. And and, uh, and we're gonna be celebrating at the family reunion because all of our businesses made it you know, through the pandemic. We had no defaults, um, they're all there. Um, so it, it's great. But at our meetings of the aunts and uncles, we meet four times a year. We always have dinner with wine and, um, and, that, and then the uh, two entrepreneurs uh, present uh, their, their business afterwards to, um, to get a loan. 
Um, so anyway, that's worked very well. And now there's two other communities in Pennsylvania who have um, modeled, uh, have their own aunts and uncles, one in Media PA and one, um, one near uh, Honesdale um, uh, PA uh, in Wayne County. Um, so um, maybe others listening out there uh, would, would, would like the, the model. Um, so we have a website, um, circleofantsanduncles.com. Um, and so all of our forms and papers and, and outlines and whatnot are there in case you want to replicate it somewhere else. Yeah, I think, I think that's such an inspiring story and an example uh, that can easily be replicated everywhere. Um, and, you know, Anya, in, in response to your question about, well, what about, you know, the big gorillas out there, the big corporate gorillas, uh, you know, I think all of us understand that these gorillas some of them survive on monopoly power when you talk about Amazon, but a lot of them survive just on government subsidies. And, and frankly, even those with monopoly power owe a lot to subsidies. Um, and I think trying to figure out ways of desubsidizing uh, the bigger corporate players and desubsidizing um, things that, that are supported in subtle ways. So in a way, the entire investment ecosystem in the United States is an example of a gigantic subsidy. We set in motion laws in the 1930s that make, made it cheap and easy for grassroots investors to put money into big companies and difficult and expensive for them to put money into small business. So that's why there is this terrible market failure when it comes to capital markets. And these are things that can be changed. The law can be changed, regulations can be changed, subsidies can be changed. And I think it, you know, it falls to us who are trying to do localization is to implement as best we can in the place we call home and where you know we love the things around us, but also to make sure that we're changing uh, the political structures, you know, state and federal and even global when you have an opportunity uh, that govern us because both things need to be done simultaneously. Yeah, I entirely agree, Michael. And uh, I think it's a good point that we have to be working on the both, both fronts at the same time. Uh, I just wanted, before we hand over, we've got some great questions here. I just wanted to say this was also, we know that we need stronger local economies operating within uh, ecological limits, you know, working for people. That means that no new economy, no transitions can be a, a, a carbon-based economy. And I think everybody has seen the light and now all the big players, even Shell and so forth, are jumping on the bandwagon. But Richard, um, I was, we haven't really heard so much from you. I'm just, you know, from my perspective, this is not a question of just switching one type of energy to another type of energy. We have to still consider, we, you know, how much energy we use, who owns it, and the scale. So part of localizing the economy should also, I think, mean localizing the energy supply and have a, a democratized energy supply. I don't know what your thoughts are on this. Well, I kind of, right, I want well, to hear I, more from you. Right, I, I certainly agree with your, your, your statement just now about uh, localizing and democratizing energy. Um, and the, the shift away from fossil fuels is going to be uh, enormously uh, challenging and transformative for society, no matter how we do it. Um, I, I worked with a, a colleague of mine, David Fridley, who's on the energy analysis team at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory uh, for a year. This was an a in-depth uh, dive into what the transition to all renewable energy could look like, what would be the, the opportunities, the costs, the barriers, and, and so on. Uh, it was, we wrote it up as, as a book. It's called Our Renewable Future, and you can find the entire text online at ourrenewablefuture.org. 
but basically in a nutshell, our findings um, were that um, the tr uh, right, uh, solar and wind produce electricity. Right now, we only use 20% of our energy in the form of electricity. The other 80% is going to require uh, new infrastructure of various kinds for transportation, for manufacturing, for mining, um, for uh, whole swaths of agriculture, and so on. Uh, this is not a simple process of, you know, shutting down the coal plant and putting up some solar panels and carrying on as we were. Um, again, this is going to be transformative for society. And the biggest uh, barrier that we encountered as, as we were trying to imagine this, this transition, and there were quite a few to tell you the truth, the biggest one is scale. Um, it's almost inconceivable that uh, enough infrastructure could be built by mid-century, you know, by 2050, 2060, to replace our current fossil fuel infrastructure at scale. Um, and that's partly because of the inherent uh, intermittency of solar and wind, of sunlight and, and wind. Um, there, there are ways of getting around that intermittency with energy storage, with uh, source redundancy, just building lots more generators than you would actually need on a, on a windy, sunny day, uh, or, or building giant energy grids to, to transfer energy from one part of the continent to another so that you can take advantage of local abundances of wind or, or sunlight. Um, but all of those come with a, a considerable cost, both in terms of investment and also in terms of the efficiency, efficiency of the entire system. You know, when you replace a coal plant with solar and wind, you, you get an efficiency gain because the coal plant's only 40% efficient at, at uh, transferring heat energy from the coal into electricity. Whereas the, the uh, uh, the solar panel, panel or wind turbine produces electricity directly. So you, there's a big efficiency gain. But if you think of it systemically with the, uh, the need for battery storage and source redundancy and larger grids, and also the need for uh, using uh, abundant electricity when it, when it is abundant to make uh, synthetic fuels out of maybe atmospheric carbon and hydrogen produced uh, with electricity. Um, that's a very inefficient process. So you're introducing all these new inefficiencies to the system. And, you know, on a net basis, it's more or less, not exactly, but more or less a wash. Uh, and some of these inefficiencies are again, going to be very costly, like the, the synthetic fuels, which, you know, if we want aviation, um, we found out with the pandemic that actually aviation isn't essential to human life. Mm -hmm. And I think that was yeah. an important finding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But if we want aviation, then we're going to have to have um, some kind of synthetic fuels to do it. And if we tried to uh, replace our, our current uh, infrastructure that is running on these fuels because it's only these fuels that can make them run. Things like uh, cement making and aviation and certain parts of agriculture. If we're going to do those with synthetic fuels, the size of that synthetic fuel industry would have to approach the scale of our current oil industry. So we're going to build all of that in the next 20 years? I don't think so. Realistically, uh, the transition from um, fossil fuels to renewable energy is going to entail a significant downsizing of our energy usage, and that's going to have impacts uh, across the board. It's going to require shortening supply chains. It's going to require economic localization. So these are, in addition to being you know, morally or politically advantageous. These are survival strategies. And the sooner we get uh, busy with them, the, the better off uh, we will be. 
I would also like to mention um, while we're on this subject that the, the big environmental organizations in my view have uh, I think failed us on this topic because for the most part they are telling us that all we have to do is transition to solar and wind and everything will be fine. And that's far, far from being the case. You know, back in the 1970s, the popular books were um, Limits to Growth and, uh, and Small is Beautiful. And those ideas have pretty much vanished from the big environmental organizations. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's a tragedy. There, there, I understand that there are political reasons within those organizations why those choices were made, uh, public relations advice that they received that you know, we need to give policymakers a, you know, a hopeful message and, and so on. Great, I, I get that. But if it's at the cost of telling the truth, that's a pretty big price to pay. And unfortunately, I, th I think that the, there, there are pretty few people who are out there, there now uh, actually telling the truth about the energy transition and what it means and what it's going to look like. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, and as you were talking, my own mental uh, voyage did take me back to those exact same books uh, and thinking how watered down the message has become, how corporate it has become, you know, uh, while we have been perhaps looking the other way and fighting single issues. And, and this whole argument has been watered down to something that is uh, very close to a lie and extremely dangerous, you know, uh, as it's, you know, being presented as, as the next big, big revolution. And we are not tackling the elephant in the room is that we cannot, simply cannot, just like we cannot have the same type of, of development that requires, I don't know how many planets it does today. You know, that's just not everybody can have growth. And uh, at that rate, it's just a big lie and we can't continue the way we are doing. And, and uh, uh, with just renewables without considering uh, how much we're using and so forth. So I'm really, really glad you said that, uh, Richard. Um, because a lot of people are going to be watching this afterwards. I'm going to shift in to some of the great questions that we've got lined up. And the first one is from Howard Tankey, who uh, uh, was thinking about indigenous economies, or, or he also calls them hunter-gatherer economies. Like, what, you know, how, can we use that kind of co concept that most of us, uh, all cultures across the globe. Uh, that was the economy before, economy based around the real needs, basic needs, and the ability to share, which is how we've survived as human species, very much linked to place, you know, how we co-evolved with place. And uh, could a modern economy operate along these lines? Can we imagine something that is based on needs and based on the resources that we have? Um, anyone wants to, to answer that or speak to this? Well, if no one else will, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, yeah, you know, we, we evolved to live in, in small groups in, uh, in, in close association knitted together with, with natural systems. Uh, that's where we're happiest and most functional. And what are the social characteristics of uh, hunter-gatherer societies? Practically no inequality. That's because they operate as gift economies where everybody basically just shares everything they have. And there are perfectly good reasons for that. That's, that, that's the best way to main trust, maintain trust within the group, which is essential to survival. So there's very little economic inequality within hunter-gatherer groups and decisions are made mostly by uh, consensus. There is situational authority based on people's demonstrated knowledge and, and skill in particular areas. You know, if, if the question comes to uh, what's the best herbal uh, treatment for a particular ailment, you go to the person who 
uh, it, within the group, usually a, a, an older woman who has years of experience with herbs. Um, <clears throat> well, we, when we lost that, uh, that horizontal uh, or organization of power by developing grain agriculture and, and uh, kingship based uh, states, uh, we, uh, we experienced a, a kind of collective trauma that we've been re-traumatizing ourselves ever since and trying in one way or another to regain some of, of what we lost through various means. <clears throat> um, I, I mean, kinship societies were universally slave societies and extremely economic, uh, economically unequal. Women and children were treated as uh, domestic uh, slaves. Um, you know, this is not the kind of life that makes people particularly happy. And so when, you know, Europeans tried to bring that way of life to the rest of, of the world, there was a lot of resistance, understandable resistance, but Europeans succeeded because they had guns, germs, and steel. Um, again, we, th there are all kinds of ways of trying to recover some of that autonomy, some of the, the gift economy, uh, that mutual trust, the, uh, the, the economic equality, the sense of um, uh, authority as based on uh, knowledge and skill rather than wealth and institutional position. Uh, and, you know, you can read all of modern history in that, in that light. <laughs> and we've, you know, some things like democracy you know, get us part of the way there. Um, Co-ops get us part of the way there. All, all of the things that we've been talking about are steps really back in that direction. Um, but understanding that, that what took us away from that is, is this thing that happened, you know, 7,000 years ago when we developed grain agriculture and cities and kings is, is, is a big step in in being able to identify what's wrong and start to, you know, build some useful workarounds. So Thank I've, you. I've, yes, I've yes. done a, a fairly substantial amount of work with tribal communities in the Pacific Northwest in the last three years. And I, I mean, a couple of things that I have learned from this experience, first of all, um, what Richard said about trauma cannot be undervalued. Um, these, these societies, you know, yes, we can hold up their traditional structure and the traditional ways in which they were able to provide for their basic needs, but those have been so shattered by several hundred years of colonization and frankly, genocide. Um, and the trauma on these communities is so deep. Um, and uh, in the United States, Native communities are the poorest, least educated. They have the thinnest economies. Um, but they, too, recognize that there are, need, you know, there are ways forward through localization. Um, and, and part of the power of localization that they see is the power of stopping to be dependent on federal handouts, which are really warping their development, have historically warped their development and try to really become more independent and also trying to develop networks of trade among native nations uh, so that, you know, even such simple things as how about producer, producer networks of tribal grocery stores? And there are so many food deserts in tribal communities and using us, you know, these simple structures, which, you know, we have some familiarity with in pockets of, of the rest of the world, trying to bring this back to native, native cultures, I think is really important. Um, so I, I feel like, yes, we can learn something by looking back at tribal civilization, but we also, we also have to be prepared to help them. 
um, and, and really empower them. And this is another case where the law and policy really gets in the way of what we're trying to go after. Um, and it's, it's interesting. I mean, you know, so Judy, I, I hope you can speak to what happened, uh, you know, with the pipeline experience that you had in native lands, because I think that's an example of how we can come together. Yeah, um, I've had, you know, I must say that um, the major turning points in my life really have been inspired by indigenous people. I mentioned earlier that I lived in an Eskimo village and it was there that, you know, I was a VISTA volunteer, uh, but to live for a year in a community that was based on sharing, you know, um, and, and cooperation to see that it's possible uh, and what it's like. Um, and where if you uh, if you accumulate more than your neighbor, that, that that's an aberration. Like you know, you're 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 really a weirdo. <laughs> you start accumulating more, and they you know I, I remember that the morning when someone knocked on my door and saying seal party seal party, and I found the tradition is that when a man catches his first seal after a long hard winter, uh, his wife has a seal party, invites everybody over, and the meat is divided evenly between all the families and then anything else that the family has accumulated during the year that they don't need for for survival is redistributed to you know to the other families um and in the modern times it's it's kind of more symbolic of throwing bubble gum and candy up into the air that everybody catches and whatnot but um it really um it changed me you know uh and when i made the decision to share my network of farmers that i had accumulated over 20 years with my competitors you know, in order to build a local supply chain, I, I feel that what gave me the courage to make that decision, because I was afraid to make that decision, quite frankly, that it would hurt my business, uh, was my experience living in the Eskimos. Oh, um, you know, that um, survival um, in the long run does de depend on, on, on sharing and, and cooperating and, and, and our society is going to become extinct unless we, and, unless we do that. Um, but uh, Mike was referring to the Standing Rock. I, I, um, in 2016, I went to Standing Rock at Thanksgiving time. Uh, I was going to feed 200 water protectors Thanksgiving dinner. We ended up feeding 2,000 because we found other resources and went to the high school in Standing Rock and, and so on. Um, and there I learned the, uh, the story of the black snake, um, it, a thousand year old prophecy that says that at some point a black snake will come up out of the ground and move across the land causing great sorrow and hardship and that they've the elders now say that they know what the black snake is and it's the oil pipeline and the fossil fuel industry um, and the prophecy goes on to say that if we do not come together as the people of the world to defeat the black snake then the world will end and of course that's where we are right now so that inspired me and then they said the elders said when you go home find the black snake in your own community and slay the black snake. So when I got back to Pennsylvania, I realized that the black snake was fracking, um, you know, and so I went on a tour to see where the fracking was. Um, and then I allied myself with a, a group that was fighting a pipeline and got arrested <laughs> and hauled off to jail and whatnot. Um, but uh, when I saw all that, you know, these um, activists were doing to, uh, in the way of giving up their time and resources and so on to defend their land, just as the Lakotas um, were doing, and it's still going on in Minneapolis, Minnesota. They're fighting, uh, you know, what is it called, Line Three or whatever, with uh, headed by Winona Leduc, the protest. Um, but um, uh, anyway, uh, you know, everybody doing what they can. But the the government, the local government, the state government is siding, you know, with the corporations, you know, um, and so that got me interested in in in, in policy. Um, and um, I, I, I now have a, a, um, a, a group of sen state senators and, and uh, representatives uh, in our state legislator that, um, that are supportive of, of local business and regional economies, um, you know, renewable energy and so on. Um, we call them the Proud Pennsylvania uh, Working Group. Um, and so uh, the, the latest issue that we're working on now is uh, legalization of, um, of the plant medicine, THC, uh, medical marijuana medical marijuana is um is legal now now they're moving to adult use um but the big corporations will own that industry and unless, unless something's done and here we have you know uh, as we all know they're localists you know that so much of our economy is owned by uh large corporations already uh, but we have the chance uh, with hemp because it's 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 controlled 
you know, even those who are just growing regular hemp for textiles or whatever, they're controlled permits. But with marijuana, it's really controlled. So the, the government should be right in there making sure that the beneficiaries of this new industry are the local small farmers and the black and brown entrepreneurs whose communities have been destroyed by the war on drugs. And this is an opportunity to do that. And what's happening is that it's continuing to go to the large corporations. Um, so that's the fight, you know, uh, that that we're engaged in now in Pennsylvania to to try and turn this around um, before it's too late, because um, you know, we see it happening everywhere. But anyway, I'm sorry, I, I just, uh, you know, uh, addressed like five different topics. <laughs> And good you did that because it was good. We, otherwise, we wouldn't have brought in that last point about the drugs as well, because this is very, very important. And uh, I'm just going to quickly go forward to the next question here. Next question for Lump Two. Uh, so, uh, Alejandro Klingenfoss from Argentina. Uh, is saying, what can we do? What would you, be your recommendation to reverse the lack of interest from any inhabitants uh, in staying in the place they grew up? So, uh, and uh, I think it's not only in Argentina and, uh, it, and uh, it's all over the world. Although we are seeing a bit of a counter trend now and have been under COVID, like you were also saying, uh, Julia, earlier on of people uh, youngsters moving back, but uh, any particular recommendations about how we can can counter that from any of you? This uh, bleeding of of communities when young people bleed. Yeah, I have a couple of thoughts. First yeah. of all, um, I think a lot of communities that bemoan the loss of young people don't value them enough. Um, and so you simultaneously see a small traditional community saying, we don't want a discotheque here. We don't want a state board park. Um, and what they're really saying to the young people is take your business elsewhere. So there needs to be a kind of cultural openness, I think. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Number two, I think some communities have actually pooled resources. They provide loans to students, to, to people who kind of graduate from uh, lower levels of education and then go on to college, but basically say, if you come back to the community, you pay little or nothing. If you don't come back to the community, you pay a lot more. So that's, that's I think, not a bad strategy. And then a third strategy, which is similar to that, is saying, if you stick around and maybe start a business, we'll give you some inexpensive housing to get started in. Um, so that, that also becomes a really important incentive. I think a lot of places with uh, university towns, with uh, students who come in and out, they're starting to think about those kinds of strategies to hold on to the talent that comes out of those universities. Okay, so I think we're gonna stay with the cities and shift to another, uh, another question here from Mark in Boston, who was on uh, attending another one uh, of the webinars this week with Helena and David Corton, Helen Norbert Hodge and David Corton. And um, uh, David was saying, uh, well, Helena was, criticizing big cities for being energy intensive and socially alienating, and while David lauded cities as energy efficient and walkable. And so the question here to you specifically, Richard, how do you envision the role of cities and population density in a post-carbon future? Right, I think um, mega cities, which uh, you know, have no precedent in in human history. I mean, uh, you know, you look at a city like New York, it was, you know, 100,000 people in uh, even, a, a, you know, a century and a half ago. Um, but now we have cities of 10, 20, 30, 40 uh, million. Uh, these urban centers on that scale, I think will be unsupportable uh, in a post-fossil fuel era. Uh, I don't see the, the transportation infrastructure as being uh, capable of 
uh, bringing sufficient resources from the countryside to enable th those kinds of uh, conurbations to, to, to persist. You know, cities have always been parasites since the very first city. They, 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 they suck people and, and resources, food primarily from, from the countryside and then uh, process them and produce wealth and culture. And you know, the cities are, I, I love many cities I've already spoken about, uh, uh, New Orleans, uh, but you know, I, I love Venice. I love, but again, many of these places are, are not going to be able to uh, persist in a, in a climate changed and post-carbon uh, future. I think we're going to need a lot more people involved in basic energy producing activities and agriculture is the, is, is the uh, or food, growing food. I think permaculture is probably a much better path forward than conventional agriculture, but we're going to need a lot more people involved in basic energy producing activities like that. And that means people uh, spread out a little bit more on the landscape. We uh, are, uh, uh, president of our PCI board, uh, Jason Bradford, uh, recently wrote a, a paper called The Future is Rural. And it's a, it's a real thought-provoking piece because he's one of the few people out there who's actually saying this. Most people take it for granted that the trend toward urbanization that we've seen over the past century and a half, especially, is going to continue. And right now, half a little over half the people in the world live in cities. Well, by 2100, it'll be 75% and then 80%. No, uh, it's a trend with a shelf life and we've passed peak urbanization uh, um, or are in the process of doing so. Yeah, it's one yeah, of the I interesting think... thing that's happened from the <laughs> pandemic, I think that the pandemic has really shifted people's locus of existence to home and they realize, okay, I can do my work or I can do a lot of networking virtually. Um, and if I can do that virtually, I should find the place on the planet I love the most and that's where I should live and do all this from. Um, and, you know, there are many, many things that Jane Jacobs got right. This is one she got wrong. Um, and, and I, I think she got it wrong because of the situation 25 years ago when she was writing. Um, and she really viewed cities as the enormous source of progress. And there are things about cities that do drive progress forward, but they also drive all the diseconomies that Richard talked about, the environmental diseconomies. And you really do see, you know, a, a shift in people's expectations that more and more people, I think, are thinking about resettling, if not in the countryside, more small towns. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, you want to say something, Judy? No, I, I was just agreeing. I mean, I've seen that in Pennsylvania. Um, the small town, there's a huge revival in, in the small rural towns. People are moving out of um, New York uh, and Philadelphia and so on and going to smaller towns and starting really fabulous restaurants and whatnot uh, to be closer to, to the farms. Um, uh, yeah, so I think that there is a trend there. And I can uh, repeat the same thing here in Mexico and also saying about, you know, the urbanization and big cities having a shelf life and during COVID here in Mexico, everybody that could had somewhere to go to would go home to their communities. And some have stayed, some have gone back. No, but it just shows, you know, you get the, you know, a small crisis, people lose their jobs and they've got nothing, you know, got nothing. Go back, they have the land, they've got a, a community that will take care of them and that will share with them, which is getting back to that point, you know, you know, in times of crisis, you need other people and you need to have a, uh, an economy, a sharing economy. I'm not thinking about just the gift economy, you know, but an economy based on sharing. I just want to highlight a, a comment here from Howard, uh, uh, who was 
just saying that don't we need um or that you know we need to encourage art amongst everybody ordinary people all of us ordinary people and we shouldn't just celebrating and highlighting you know people that do it for a living or especially famous no uh because um and uh, well i certainly would agree with that that you know a creating living culture is made up of of all of us no and right. uh, I, and, I, and I, arts I, and music yeah richard over to you sure. yeah i mean I, I i i i agree with that too and um and we appreciate art more when we have the experience of doing it ourselves and then when somebody next to us does it you know more even more beautifully wow we really have a basis on which to um really treasure and uh, and honor and understand just what a gift that is right now so much of our music art etc is globalized and commercialized and uh to me there's there there could be nothing more um uninteresting than listen than you know knowing what's the most popular mp3 download right now on or you know youtube performance whatever i mean that's but knowing a, a, a local musician who's made a breakthrough or, or, or written a beautiful song or contributed something, that to me, that's, you know, that's something that's, that's like, yeah, that's, that makes life a, a lot more beautiful to me. Mm -hmm. It does indeed. I, I think yeah. um, you know, the, the idea of local tourism uh, is important here. Um, you know, um, I've been promoting that in Pennsylvania, you know, uh, instead of going to New York uh, to do something, why not go to uh, another town in Pennsylvania, Bethlehem, PA, you know, my daughter just went there with her boyfriend, it's about, you know, an hour and a half in Philadelphia, a smaller town, uh, and, and was looking at all the old steel mills that have closed down that have now become a museum or something, like every every place, you know, has a story, as, as was mentioned, you know, earlier. Um, and, and, and those stories can, I think Michael was talking about that, those stories can be turned into tourist attractions. Um, and, you know, it saves on the carbons, you know, you drive your electric car um, a couple hours in your own state and, 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 and spend your dollars in the, in the rural towns that need the money, you know, in their restaurants and their shops and so on. Um, and I hope that's gonna become a trend. That's certainly something that we're pushing through all together now, um, you know, to, um, popularize the idea of, of local tourism. And, and, and part of that is very much about supporting our local artists and our local musicians, um, you know, to, to make them the, our heroes instead of going to New York or Paris or, <laughs> or London or something, you know, go to a little town in your own state and find the local talent that's there and support it. Very good advice. Uh, I just, uh, we, we, uh lacking towards the end here but just two questions one question and one comment actually uh, uh ralph from uh from london who's been taking part this week uh and who would like to pay his way forward and share about all things that we have he's heard about during the week and here at this session he's asking if there's any if you have any materials or kind of uh, that free that he can share with others. So I'm just saying that to all three of you, if you have any, you could uh, pop them in, in the chat box and we'll make sure they get to Ralph uh, afterwards, even if you just have some names of anything and we can find them. And then we have here from uh, Simran Chopra, who's, who's asking uh, uh, Richard whether this renewable energy trend is going to lead to more extractive and destructive practices. Well, if if we try to do it at the current scale of energy usage, absolutely. I mean, mm -hmm. sunlight and wind are renewable. Solar mm -hmm. panels and wind turbines are not. They're made out of resources extracted from the ground and processed using energy. And, and then they have a lifetime of maybe 20, maybe 30 years. And then they become, you know, you have to 
at best recycle them, which takes more energy and you lose some quality in the materials in the process. And there's, there's really no, um, no free lunch in, <laughs> in the world of energy and materials. We right now, the human enterprise is operating at an unsustainable scale. And we need to get that and understand it. And the, the, the solution for that is maybe partly in substituting more benign chemicals for more toxic chemicals. Yeah, that helps. But ultimately, it's, it's a matter of, of reducing the scale of the human enterprise. Exactly. Well, I'd like to thank all three of you so much for your time. If anyone would you like to um, finish off with a, a, a concluding comment, feel free and then we'll wrap up after that. Well, I have to say that I, I encourage people um, to stop traveling as much as possible and to dig in at home and find the joys um, uh, and the happiness uh, that are in one's own community, the local artists and musicians and the history um, of a place are to me much more interesting uh, you know, than, than, than traveling to, to famous places around the world. Love the place you're in. Exactly. Yep. And one way you can love the place you're in is look at where your money is going and it, just challenge yourself to shift 1% this coming year to something local and see what that does for you and your community. <laughs> Very sound advice. Thank you so much, all three of you. And thank you to our listeners. And uh, thank you for the great questions. And I hope a lot of other people get to, to see this afterwards, which I'm sure. Thank you. From local Thank you. Bye, all. Nice Bye. to see you. Bye-bye. <laughs>